I'm going to preach around the Christmas theme. My message uh, is titled, And Glory Shown Around. And Glory Shown uh, Around. And uh, you know that as a phrase in a popular Christmas carol, while shepherds watch their flocks by night, uh, the glory shown around. My text is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and verses 8 to 14. Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is the first announcement of Jesus' birth, right? Somewhere about that time, uh, the star appeared in the east and the wise men also started their journey towards the newborn king. It took them about two years to get to where Jesus was. But the shepherds were the first people who heard the announcement and went to see what had happened. So their story is very, very important. And today in my message, I'm going to just focus on four important uh, ideas that we find uh, in this passage. The first one has to do with the shepherds. They are the main theme of the story. Now you have to understand that among the Jews of this period, shepherds were held in very low esteem. According to the Talmud, they were not allowed in courts as witnesses. Shepherds were not the brightest people in society. They are not the most elevated people. Shepherds were people who stayed outside the community. They tended the sheep, but they did a very important job. Apart from uh, raising sheep that people would buy and eat uh, their flesh uh, for their normal meals, they also provided the animals that would be sacrificed in the temple. So the shepherds were playing two roles. They play roles that is domestic to the people. They rear sheep. People go to buy the sheep and have their Christmas stew with it or Christmas uh, light soup with it. Um, and then also when people wanted to make a sacrifice in the temple, the shepherd would be the one who reared the sheep that they were offering. So the shepherds played that role in the society. And it's very instructive that the angel of the Lord went to them because there is some significance there that we'll get to very soon. So the passage says that the shepherds were watching over their flock by night. So the story opens in the night. The shepherds are watching over the flock. There is a sense of diligence about these shepherds. It's nighttime. They've been working daytime, watching over the flock, taking care of their flock. Now it's night, and they go to sleep, but the passage says they are still watching. They're still watching. So it shows you a very diligent group of people, very attentive, and, and, and by day or by night, they were very mindful of their sheep, keeping watch over them. But the important thing I want you to note that this is happening in the night. It's happening in the night. So at another level, they are in the dark. They are in darkness. 
They're, they're diligent people, they're good people, they are honest people, but they're still in the dark. And in a sense, the story of the shepherds paints the picture of humanity. People who are good, who are decent, who are doing their work, but still in the dark. You know, sometimes we think if people are good people, then automatically they are right with Christ. But being right with Christ has nothing to do with your approach to work. You can be a good worker, you can be a good, decent human being, and still live in sin, and still be in the dark without the light of God. So this is the first thing we see, they are in the night. The second picture we see about them, that all of a sudden, they are in the light. The glory of God shone around them, the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and all of a sudden, the night is bright. The atmosphere has changed from darkness to light. Isn't it amazing how God's love is able to reach us even when we are in the dark? He's able to come to us with the glory of the gospel of the power of Christ. God is able to come to the light or come to our night and bring us light. So these shepherds experience light surrounded by God's glory. They are in a good place. But then the Bible says something happens when the light comes. It says, and they were afraid. They were terrified by God's glory. I mean, when, when, you, when I read the Bible, these, this, I, I pay attention to all kinds of things. They are not afraid of the night. In the night, there is no fear, but they are afraid of the light. The light comes, the glory is shining. And they are scared, but in the dark, which is the normal place where people should be afraid, they have no fear. But when the light comes, they are afraid. It shows us the picture of human beings. That many times when God's light shines in our lives, we get afraid. In fact, that's one of the reasons why people don't go to church. Because they are afraid they are going to hear something that will bring light to them and will convict them of something bad they are doing and they don't want to stop it. So they don't want to go to church. These days a lot of Christians will say, oh, I worship God online. And they know they are not telling the truth. They are not worshiping online. Only a few people worship online sincerely. Only a few. Majority do not. They use it as a care of because they don't want to hear something that will convict them. They don't want to leave the dark into the night, into the light. So the glory of God shines and the shepherds are scared. In fact, in the Greek uh, uh, writing of it, the fear is repeated. They are fearfully afraid. They are fearfully afraid. In other words, these guys are beyond fear. Why? The glory of the Lord is shining. But listen to the response of the angel. The angel tells them, don't be afraid. I bring you the good news. And if we can ever get to understand that God is not there just to cause pain to us, to cause havoc to us, that when God reveals even our sin to us, he is not revealing our sin because he wants to punish us. He wants to reveal your sin to you because there is good tidings of great joy. God's revelation is always a cause for joy and excitement. So for the sh shepherds, they are in the night, they find the light, they are afraid, but they are assured. Take it easy. God is not about to club your head because of something terrible you did. The second thing we want to look at is the story of the shepherds, of the, of the angel. The story of the angel is very simple. He says, the Savior is born. Salvation has begun. The process 
of salvation has become. And why is this very significant? Because this is what the Jews have been waiting for for all this time. They've been waiting for this Redeemer, for the Messiah. Of course, their view of the Messiah was that he was going to come and knock off the Romans. But they are waiting for whoever the Savior is. And the angels, angel comes and says, the Savior is born. What you've waited for has come to pass. What you've been expecting is now here. Your hope is now reality. Isn't that the good news God wants to give us this morning to tell us that what you've been praying for, what you've been hoping for is already here. In Christ, we have the fullness of life. If you want to have life, he's Jesus. You want to have hope, he's Jesus. You want to have liberty, he's Jesus. You want to experience grace, he's Jesus. You want to prosper, he's Jesus. You want to, you want to abound, he is Jesus. Whatever you need, he's Jesus. If you can understand that everything you need in life is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Everything you need. You know, we go through the year, we are hustling and we are hustling and we are working and we are laboring and we are going to and fro and we want peace and we want money and we want all of that. If we come to understand that everything we are looking for is in Christ Jesus. What you've been waiting for has already come. What you hope to come has come. What you wish to come has come. In Christ is the fullness of the Godhead completely. Perfectly. He is everything you need. There is nothing you need that is outside of Jesus Christ. In him there is fullness of joy. There is peace. There is love. There is completion. He is it. He is it. That's what the angel says. The Savior is born. What you've been waiting for has happened. This is it. So that's, those are the first two. The shepherds, the story. Then the angel said, I'm going to give you the sign. I'm going to show you how you can identify the Savior. You're going to find him somehow. So what is the sign? He says you're going to find a baby lying in a manger. I always wondered, you know, why is that a sign? A baby lying in a manger? Why is it a sign? So there is something about this baby lying in a manger that was going to help the shepherds to find the Savior. Now, when we read the Bible, because we read the Bible in our day, uh, many times we, we use our current understanding of things to understand the Bible. But the story of the Bible didn't happen in our day. It happened 2,000, especially the story of Jesus, happened 2,000 years ago. So certain words in the Bible, if we quickly bring it into our day, uh, the, the, the meaning may not be accurate. Uh, and one of that is, is that... Uh, Jesus was born in a manger because there was no room in the inn. There was no room in the inn. Now, today when we say inn, we mean something like a hotel or a commercial guest house. So, so then immediately we translate inn means guest house. So Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem and they were looking for a hotel. And they didn't get a hotel. To, to go. That, that's about how, how we understand in. Um, but 
you know, the first thing you have to understand is Mary and Joseph, Bethlehem is their hometown. And I don't know about how many of you go to your hometown to live in a hotel. I mean, if you went to your hometown now, except, you know, you, you are not a proper hometown person, and you are quarreling with all your relatives, and nobody wants to see you in the home, in the village again. So you go there, and everyone shuts their door. But normally when you go to your hometown, you're going to find a relative to live with. You are either going to go to your father's house, your grandfather's house, or maybe your cousin who has built a house, but you're going to find a place to live. So Mary and Joseph cannot go to their hometown looking for hotel. I mean, it doesn't make sense. So what does the Bible mean by an inn? Now, those days, buildings were very simple. These days, we, we, we build a house and we have master bedroom and guest room and three bedrooms here and, and all of that. But those days, uh, you know, most houses will have one big room. One big room and an ante room. And, and the one big room is where everybody stays. Privacy was not as prized then as it is now. So when you go to a place to stay, about 10, 20, 30 people can be jammed in one room. Everybody's sleeping there. Uh, and, and that room, that guest, that main room, what, what today we may call living room or sitting room, is what was called an inn. So the inn is the big room where everybody stays. So the picture you want to see is Mary and Joseph have gone to their hometown and other people too had come to the hometown because remember, they are coming for a census. So the hometown uh, has a lot of people coming. They go to their family house and, and there's so many people are there. So they all live in the inn. They live in the inn, the living room. So probably there are about 20 or so people in that room. And most of the time in those days, people would uh, keep their domestic animals like sheep and so on. In the morning, they take them out. But in the evening, they bring them in and they bring them into the house. In fact, in certain places in Ghana, it's still done where... Uh, the family cow, family sheep are, are brought in and they stay in the same room with the human beings. It's not rare. You are too privileged. You don't understand the world. I can show you places in Accra where it still happens, where the animals live in the house. So normally if, if Mary gave birth, it should be in the inn, in the living room, if there were not many people. But there's so many people in the living room, so they have to go to where the animals are normally kept, side, somewhere on the side, and they pick this uh, newborn baby and, and take the child and put the child in the manger, in the trough, in the place where the animal's food is kept. So just to clarify what it means when it says there was no room in the inn, it's not talking about a hotel. It's not talking, I don't even think Bethlehem had hotels at that time. It's too small to have a hotel. It simply means in the living room amongst humans, where the human beings normally would live, there was no room for him, and, and they had to find a room nearby for where the sheep are and put him there. Now I want you to bear in mind something that has happened. The story starts with shepherds. And now Jesus is bundled up to where the sheep are. The Bible is painting a very clear picture of who Jesus Christ is. That this guy who has been born is actually the Lamb of God who is going to save people from their sins. And that's why the shepherds are chosen in the first instance because normally the she shepherds would be the one who would certify that this sheep is right to be sacrificed. This is the right one. And so 
The angel says, when you go, go to the manger where you normally find the sheep and do your inspection. And when you go, you will find that this one who has been born is truly the one who will be sacrificed by God for the sins of the world. That's the sign. Of course, I'm sure many children were born, probably born in Bethlehem about that time. But no child was born and laid in a manger. Only one was born and laid in a manger. And shepherds who understand the dynamics of it are told to go and find him to see whether it is so. And as you read later on, they went and found that it is so. Truly, the Son of God, the Lamb of the world, has been born. So that's the first, second, third thing, the sign, a baby lying in a manger. Shepherds, manger, lamb. And the idea is very clear, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Final thing is the song the song of the angels. The angel of the Lord who announces the story, who tells the sign, the passage says, is joined by a host of angels. So many angels. And they come and they start singing. And they, they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Two things, first is the praise, glory to God in the highest. Why are the angels saying glory to God in the highest? The angels are saying everything that has happened to bring Christ to birth is totally, completely the work of God. This is not the work of man. This is the work of God. Why? God is the one who gave the promise from Genesis chapter 3 and has been giving promises throughout the Old Testament. This is all God. God is the one who chose the vessel, Mary. God is the one who protected the seed. God is the one who brought them to Bethlehem and beyond everything, this child who is born is God. So who gets the glory for what has happened? No one except glory to God in the highest. The coming of Christ, the life of Christ, the mission of Christ, everything about Jesus Christ, it's all about God. It's God come in the flesh. That's the incarnation. God come in the flesh. But then they say something to those of us who are on earth. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. No judgment. Not anger. Not hatred. Not God striking at us. On earth, peace and goodwill towards all men. Towards all people. What a message. You know, when I was a younger preacher, I felt that condemning people, speaking about people's sins, was the smartest way to preach. In those days, we went to preach and would tell, look at you. Hellfire is waiting for you. Look at you, and normally it's against the women. I don't know why we don't do it to the men. Look at you, your mini skirt. You think you will go to heaven? Look at your painted fingers. Your painted face. And painted this and painted. And, and, we, and, and we, we, we just scare people and think maybe if we can make them scared so much. They will turn. I'm sure there is a place for scaring people when they haven't listened to mercy for so long, you have to scare them. 
But listen to the message. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, not fire and brimstone. On earth, peace, goodwill. From whom? From God. It's not just human beings showing goodwill, you know. Well, normally we do that at Christmas. Is, you know, we show goodwill to people. But the story is not about human beings having goodwill. It's about God having goodwill. God thinks good about you. And he wills to do the good he thinks about you. Does it include the sinner? Yes, God has good will towards the sinner. God has good will towards the wicked. God has good will towards people you have no will for. That's why I always wonder when people are praying there and they are talking to this God who says good will towards men. They say, Father, this guy sat on my promotion. He doesn't have my good will, so you kill him. You kill him because I didn't get promoted. Deny his children of a father and deny his wife of a, of a husband because my promotion has been delayed for three years. It's not even equal measure punishment. At least the best you can do is God sit on his promotion too. But why should, why should God... Why should God kill him? Now, if you come to God, his peace, goodwill. So I came here to tell you, God's message towards you is peace and goodwill. Maybe you are scared of God. Probably you are afraid. You look at your life and you feel judgment is coming. Lightning will strike me. Oh, something will happen. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm going to die. Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I can't make it. God says, hey, 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 fear not. Don't be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy. You know, many times I, I get amazed that people would say that they, they are, God gives them revelation or a prophetic word about somebody. And then they tell the person, the Lord says this and the Lord says that and the Lord says that. And of course, it includes your house number and all of that and all of that. Well, I know my house number. I don't even know whether that's a useful information. If you tell me my house number, which I already know. But, you know, they go through all of that. And then they, they, at the end, so you are in the dark, they bring the light, and you are afraid. And they tell you, if you don't do so and so, such calamity will come upon you. It doesn't rhyme with this. This one says you are in the light. You are in the dark. You saw the light. You are afraid. And the story is, fear not. I bring you good tidings of great joy. In other words, when God reveals something about you that is scary, his next voice is, fear not. I bring you good tidings of great joy. So you went to the doctor and he told you something. God says, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. Don't let the light, the revelation, what you know, scare you. Because the story of Christmas, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And this morning, this same God is announcing good tidings of great joy in this house. And I don't know how your year has been from January till now, but there is good tidings of great joy. I don't know what darkness has enveloped you but this morning, there is good tidings of great joy. And to receive that, there are two things we're going to do this morning. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God has done everything you need for your salvation. He's done everything. All you need to do is to believe and receive. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, with every head bowed, every eye closed, 
just want to pray with you that this Lamb of God will find room for you in your house, in your heart. If you are here, you want to be born again, you want to give your life to Jesus, maybe you say, Pastor, I don't even understand what it means to be born again. Then you must be born again. I don't even, I'm not sure whether a, a crisis in my heart or not. Then be sure. If you want to be sure, you want to have assurance of salvation, just lift up your right hand wherever you are. Lift up your hand wherever you are. And we're going to pray very shortly. Let your hand shoot up. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. God is not going to harm you. Thank you for putting your hands up. The ushers look out for those who have their hands up. The ushers are going to give you something, put something in your hand shortly. If you receive one, you can put your hand down. And we're all going to pray together. Those of you who lifted up your hand, I want you to put your hand on your heart as we pray this solemn prayer. And everybody join us in this prayer. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I ask you, Father, save me through the sacrifice of Christ. Forgive me. Wash away my sins. Make me stand right before you. I thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you pray that prayer, I believe that you have eternal life this morning and there is joy in the presence of God because you have come home to Christ Jesus, your Lord. But it's not only about salvation. It's also about God's good tidings that changes a negative story into a positive one. So for everybody who is dealing with darkness, a dark spot in your life, whatever that is, it may be some news, it may be in your marriage, it may be in your health, it may be whatever it is, there is good news for you. I bring you good tidings of great joy. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is help in the name of Jesus. And if you believe that, just stand up with me for a moment as we pray that the power of God will touch you wherever you are in the next two minutes. In the next two minutes. In the next two minutes, something is going to happen in your life. Turn your life around. Turn the situation around. The story is going to start negative, but it's going to end positive. I said it's starting in the dark, but it will end in the light. It will start with despair, but it will end in glory. Lift up your hands to God. And just receive God's goodness. Receive his goodness. He's a good God. Receive his goodness into your life, into your situation, into your finances, into your health. Receive his goodness into, into the life of your children. Father, we stand today fully assured of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Fully confident that in him we have life and we have more life more abundantly. We stand here settled in our faith that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, that there is nothing beyond him. He is our all in all. And so, Father, by that much less name of Jesus, I speak into the life of everybody here, and I speak, O oh God, glad tidings of great joy. I speak glad tidings of great joy into their finances, into their health, into their marriage, into their physical being, into every area of their being, into their relationship. I speak glad tidings of great joy. May the Lord your God heal you. May the Lord your God deliver you. May the Lord your God establish you. May the Lord your God turn the situation around. May the Lord your God give you a testimony. May the Lord give you a testimony between now and the end of the year. Next week about this time. 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 You will have a testimony. You will have a testimony. Your story will change. In the name of Jesus. And if you believe that he has done it, then lift up your hands and worship him for a moment. Lift up your voice. 
We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace and goodwill towards all men.